Dr. Michelle Johnston, welcome to the Human Capital Leadership Podcast. Oh, thank you, John. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for having me on your show. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from New Orleans. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about your recent book, The Seismic Shift in Leadership. I always love interviewing authors about their books, not only because I'm just interested in the process of, of uh, you know, the heart and soul that goes into um, these, these works, and I'm also just fascinated by the content. So I'm super thrilled to have the opportunity to sit down with you and have this conversation. As we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, Dr. Michelle Johnston's background and bio. Dr. Michelle Johnston is a management professor, executive coach, and leadership expert who serves as the Gaston Chair of Business at Loyola, at Loyola University, New Orleans. Her first book, The Seismic Shift in Leadership, is an Amazon bestseller, which details the need for leaders to shift from command and control to connection to achieve long-lasting results. And I could go on, but I'm going to pause there and refer the audience to the show notes for more details. And I want to give you, Michelle, a chance to share a little bit more about your background and personal context before we dive on into the conversation around your book. Yeah, absolutely. So as you said, John, I'm in New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana, um, and I've been here for a while, and it's a city that really taught me a whole lot about connection because it's a city, I dedicated my book to the city of New Orleans where you don't have to be perfect. Mm. And, and it's a city that really does embrace individuality and it embraces imperfection and it embraces community and connection. So I had no idea when I was 20, I think 23 years old and I was getting my PhD up the road at LSU and I was working for a consulting firm and fell in love with this city. I'm not from here. I don't have family here. I had no idea that by making that decision to set up shop here, that it would have such an impact on me and my research. I mean, who knew? So yeah, so I've been at Loyola University, New Orleans for over 20 years, teaching leadership and management, and I'm an executive coach. And so after all of these years of, of working with leaders and working with students and researching um, culture, connection, and leadership, that's what drove me to write this book. Very cool. And as a fellow scholar practitioner myself, I'm at um, the university um, at south of Salt Lake, and uh, it's it's kind of a unique thing, right, to have uh, people that are in the academic space and in the practitioner space um, doing this kind of work. Uh, so we have a connection there, and uh, maybe just a little bit about your background, if you don't mind, sharing with the audience, you know, how you made that transition or why you decided to make that transition. Um, you know, from the consulting world and practitioner space into academia. And of course, you, you're continuing to bridge that and you're doing both. Yeah, it's really, it's a, it's a cool story. I just had the pleasure and the good fortune of spending Labor Day weekend with my 78-year-old father. And he's fantastic. And growing up, he was a corporate guy with General Motors. So we moved every two years and he always made it such an adventure back then with big in big corporate environments. If you were good at your job and got promoted, they transferred you. They did not want you leading the people that you were had been working with. They promoted you to a new market to learn and grow. And I don't think they do that as much these days because it really wasn't best, I don't think, for the family. But boy, we had great adventures and moved all over the country. And every night we'd have dinner together, my mom, dad, brother, and I, and we would talk about corporate culture. And we would talk about leadership and teams and motivation and how to inspire, how to lead. And so that really set the tone early on for me and my interest in what I eventually pursued and pursued in my um, MBA and my um, PhD and my dissertation, which is all about culture and connection and environment. And so you had asked about consulting and, and I never saw myself, even when I was getting my PhD, I never saw myself as an academic, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be in the consulting world. And, and so my entire 20s, I was working for a company called Spectra and I loved it. And it was really more training and development. And I flew all over the country leading workshops on teamwork and presentation skills and listening and meeting management. I loved it and was in heaven. And I was finishing my dissertation and teaching at Tulane. I was teaching at Loyola and I was teaching a course at the University of New Orleans. And 
and at, at night and just loving life. And it was the dean at Loyola, Pat O'Brien, who took me aside. He said, hey, I really want you to teach business communication, make it mandatory. It was an elective, make it a requirement for all business majors. And you have the pedigree to do that. And I want you to be in charge. And so that's what brought me into academia because I didn't pursue the traditional route. I didn't finish my, my PhD and then go on the market and get whatever position. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was with a consulting firm teaching at night and he brought me in. And so it ended up being the best of, of both worlds. And, but I did end up really putting my head down and having to focus on publisher parish. And I did go on full on tenure track and that route for a while. And then once I made full professor, that's when I really um, got involved with becoming an executive coach. Yeah. Well, I, there's so much of your background and your story that resonates with me and is similar to my own path and, and uh, trajectory. So that that's for another day. But uh, thank you for sharing a little bit about that. And I do think we need the world needs more scholar practitioners uh, that where our, our research can inform our practice and vice versa, where we can bring in the real world into the classroom and help you know our students and prepare our students for the jobs of tomorrow. So all of that's amazing. All right, well, let's dive into your book now. You've talked about command and control, um, styles of leadership and how that shifted over time. You've talked about the connection piece, how that's very crucial and essential in the modern world of work and in the future of work. Um, it sounds like that's kind of the crux premise of your book, The Seismic Shift in Leadership, but unpack a little bit more for us what the purpose of this book was, why this book, why now, uh, and then we can start to dive into more detail. Absolutely. So I've learned so much through this process, John, particularly because all of my degrees were in communication. It was either mm -hmm. public relations journalism, organizational communication, communication theory. So the lens through which I view the world is from a communicative lens. And yet what I was seeing at the highest levels of companies is that that transactional nature, which was just mm. communication, getting information from point A to point B, kind of transacting and directing was what was shifting out of style. Because it was much more of that command and control, hierarchical, I am in charge, I've got the power, and I'm just going to push down the information to you, and you're going to go do it. And I was learning so much about connection, and connection is very different. Connection requires reciprocity. Connection requires give and take. Connection actually requires you showing your people that you care about them that you see them, you hear them, you value them, you appreciate them. And that made me so uncomfortable as an academic. So I was like, oh, no, 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 no. We've got to take feeling out of it. No, no, <laughs> it's got to be very cut and dry. The leader gives information, directs. And, and so it th this whole new line of research really shook my world as well. And I think that's why I called it the seismic shift because I had bought into the command and control. As a professor, I showed up. I professed, <laughs> I shared information, then they had to go and figure it out and do it. And, and, and then when the millennials and, and uh, then the, all of the different um, generations started saying, what, this is not working for me. I want to, I want to be seen. I want to be heard. I want to be appreciated. I want to be valued. And I was of a certain age of the old school, like your paycheck is your reward. What you want to go to <laughs> yoga? What you want work family balance? What? And I got to tell you, John, as we all know now, they got it right, you know, it, and, and it was a seismic shift. And I think the pandemic just catapulted us. It turned the power over to the people and it made all of us at the higher levels and the leaders go, whoa, wait, oh my gosh, we have to change. We have to adapt. I was just coaching one of my favorite clients. He's the CEO of a big healthcare system. And he said, yeah, we just did this huge McKinsey culture survey. And we found out, yep, Michelle, we were right. The new generation does not want to be led by the command and control leaders. We have got to adapt. They want it differently. And finally, I think they have the voice and they have the power. So yeah, that's why I wrote the seismic shift. I was a part, I think I was a part of the problem in that old school style of thinking. And I wanted to make 
um, get my message heard, you know, the shot heard around the world. I really wanted to make a big impact. So now I'm only teaching one class a semester at Loyola so that I could make more of a global impact and get the message out and help leaders adapt and adjust and create positive work environments where their people can thrive. This is a whole different way of thinking. Yeah, it really is a different mindset around leadership. And and you've identified, in part, there's a generational piece here, right? Um, you know, there, you go back to the great generation, to the baby boomers and even Gen X, there's much more of a, a willingness to go along with this command control, top-down, hierarchical type of leadership style. That's kind of what everyone was used to and what they just did. And in part, that I think that's also why some of the attitudes around millennial and Gen Z workers have been, you know, negative, frankly, you know, around, well, these people are entitled. Why do they expect all these different things? Um, and from my perspective, you know, I've been in the space a long time um, teaching about leadership and effective organizations, effective teams, employee empowerment, you know, all these related topics. And, you know, from my perspective, I'm just like, no, like millennial and Gen Z workers aren't entitled. They're simply, they have an ex expectation around proper management and proper leadership. <laughs> and I mean, everything that they want is exactly what I teach them they should have. Um, and it's exactly what I teach, you know, a good leader would do. And so I think there's just been a, a shift in attitudes around what appropriate leadership styles are, you know, what's expected. Um, and, you know, again, part of that's generational, part of that's just a shift in the, in the landscape in the, in the landscape of work, um, regardless of, of the real driving reason behind it. The, the reality is today's workforce is demanding it right. Uh, in part, I think this is a, a byproduct of the pandemic. I think lots of people, including, you know, older generations of workers, Gen X and, and uh, baby boomers increasingly also, you know, during the pandemic realized, you know, why am I doing this? Uh, you know, I expect more from my employer. I expect more from, from my boss. And generally speaking, I think these are all healthy things, you know, to push back a little bit and to challenge some of the assumptions that perhaps we've had in the past around the way work should function and the way leaders should lead, et cetera. Um, so that seismic shift piece that you, that's in your title, I think that's, uh, that's very appropriate and it's telling. And it's not to say that there haven't been people in the space talking about this and pushing towards this kind of reform and, and this kind of a shift for a long time, because there has, but I, I think there's been a lot of resistance over time. And, and I think we've continued to make steady movement in the right direction. Uh, and I think the the leaders of today and tomorrow and the organizations of today and tomorrow that are going to be successful and sustainable, who are going to be able to attract and retain good talent uh, are the ones that lean into this connection piece that you've so aptly highlighted. Uh, so maybe tell us a little bit more about that connection piece. I know so much of your research has been around this. Why have you identified connection as a really critical piece towards these long lasting, sustainable organizations and the types of results that everyone wants to see? Yeah. And so now my new tagline is connection drives results. And that's what all the research is showing is that if you build a culture of connection as a leader, whether it's just with your team or across divisions or with the entire company, if you intentionally build time for meaningful connection and show your people that they're not just a cog in a wheel, that you're not just interested in them and the results they bring and the numbers, that you care about them as a full person, and, and you give your team a chance uh, to get to know each other as full humans. As a matter of fact, I just got off of a coaching call with a CEO of a hospital. And I said, so what do you give me one best practice that you're doing this month to connect with your people? And he said, we're meeting at happy hour tonight from four to six. And he said, and they've been wanting this for a while. It's been a grind. And so even just something like that, it's, it's been, you know, once a quarter, I'm advocating for leaders to bring your people together, do an offsite. I just worked with another CEO and, and he invited me to his offsite um, and they did a cooking competition. 
um, to kick off the, the day retreat. So the night before we all showed up, we're in New Orleans. So we have these great cooking schools and it was a competition. And it was so amazing to see the laughter, the levity and, and just and not, not talking about work yeah. and what a great kickoff, you know? So yeah, it, it is all about building, intentionally building a culture of connection. I really think John that Brene Brown Mm -hmm. um, really planted the seed when she started talking about when her Ted talk went viral and she really started talking about belonging and that the opposite of belonging was fitting in. And I think what happened was so many of us of a certain age and generation, we were, I'm Gen X, we were trained to just to fit in, to fit in and adapt, fit in and adapt right. and, and not necessarily be an individual. And, and especially as a woman, you know, I was kind of told, or at least the messaging I got was, um, you, you can't really throw, I don't want to curse on your show. Um, I think <laughs> it's it was, fine. <laughs> I, I think it was something like, um, as women, we really just needed to fit in. I remember when I was coming yeah. up in the tenure track position as junior faculty members, we were told to not speak during faculty me meetings. We were told that. Really? Do not speak during faculty meetings. If I were you and you want to get promoted, don't speak. That's and so <laughs> it's terrible, totally terrible. And so I think the message was we just had to fit in, look around, fit in, look around, fit in. And yet that's the opposite of belonging. And as humans, yeah. we want to belong. Well, what's the essence of belonging is connection. So how do you truly feel connected with your tribe, right? If, if you're encouraged not to even speak. Um, so I think she planted the seed that we as humans, and boy, did that TED Talk resonate and make, made her a superstar because we as hum humans realized that there was something missing in our lives and we wanted more belonging. And it and resonated so with everybody, right? Like everyone knew everybody. that that was a true statement. <laughs> yes. we. It, I, I remember tears rolling down my face when I read her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, because as a corporate brat growing up, moving around every two years, I'd become really, really good at fitting in. To, to at a great cost to myself, because again, at Loyola, I just kind of did what was expected of me and, and I fit in and I didn't raise a ruckus and I wasn't necessarily, I didn't do anything to really differentiate myself. And so how can you truly be successful if you're just trying to be like everybody else? And it wasn't until I read her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, realized that I had not owned my story, that I was not authentic, that I would show up to the classroom just trying to be like everybody else of whatever success looked like to me. And no wonder I, I wasn't soaring. I mean, I was surviving. I wasn't thriving. And so it wasn't until I had that big wake up moment and I realized, wow, I need to figure out who I am. I need to stop adapting and really differentiate myself and lean in with my gifts, right? The gifts of imperfection. And John, once I did that, my career took off, everything changed. And so I, I, I really like how you talked about surviving versus thriving. That's the difference, right? And so many people find themselves in that situation where for whatever reason, you know, whether it's the intention of the leader in the organization to kind of put them in that box or not, you know, or it's just societal norms and values and whatever they, they feel like the perception of what they are expected to do, whatever the reason for it, when people are surviving, they're not thriving. Uh, they're when people are trying to fit in, they're not being their authentic self. And you just mentioned, like, we need to shake the rock, the boat, we, we need people who are going to challenge stuff, we need people to make good trouble in organizations. And we don't need people to sit by and, and play nice and just don't say anything. You know, I, I mean, there's so much layered sexism into that comment of what you received about not talking in those meetings. I can't even believe that someone told you that on the one hand, on the other hand, I get it because in a world where it's messy and complex, especially for, for uh, you know, women or for women of color or for other marginalized populations, it, it, it seems in some ways as good advice to, to, to move forward and to get ahead, but it's really terrible advice and it's horribly sexist advice. <laughs> and we, we need to disrupt that. We need people to do more challenging, right? You are so right, because the messages I got was to tone it down. And that I, I had a big personality. And, and so I, I thought, oh, gosh, okay, well, then I'm not going to be successful if I lean in with my big personality and, and, and my excitement and my enthusiasm for my craft. And so I just became a different person. And the good news is it didn't work. 
Mm. <laughs> and the dean called me in his office and said, why are your faculty evaluations lower than average? I said, well, I don't know. I'm doing what everybody told me to do. I'm, I'm, I'm doing exactly what everybody told me to do. He said, well, look at, and this was really great advice. He said, well, look at what they say your strengths are. He goes, what are your strengths? What are your students telling you that work? And I said, well, they say I'm really enthusiastic and passionate. They said, okay, well, lean in with that. Don't try to, to tone that down, right? Yeah. And that's that was a part of my journey, right? So that so so I also didn't trust myself, John, because mm -hmm. I realized that I had just been trying to fit in and I wanted to learn what real connection was. So I knew that that was my thesis. And then I, I didn't trust myself to write a book about it because I wasn't getting it right. So then I went and interviewed 18 global leaders around the world to figure out what connection was, what it looked like, sounded like, felt like, and what disconnection was and mm -hmm. how disconnection, what the consequences were, and then how do you recover and figure out connection? And so that's what I learned about giving up perfection, authenticity, servant leadership, leaning in with listening, creating the positive culture. And once I found those characteristics, that's when I wrote the book. Okay. So I said, here's the seismic shift. No more command and control jerk bosses doesn't work anymore. What we need to lean in with is true, meaningful connection, making sure your people feel seen, heard, valued, respected, and appreciated. And here's how to do it. And so you first have to connect with yourself at that foundational level so that you can show up authentically. Then and only then can you really connect meaningfully with your team and with others. And that's by leaning in with compassion and kindness. And then and only then can you get to that third level of connection, which I think is the highest level, and that's connection with your company. And that requires true alignment. And you only can do that if you know yourself, you know your team, you know where the company is going. You believe where the company is going. Again, kind of the pandemic is another reference. So many people woke up and said, I'm not only, I don't, I don't believe in where the company is going. I don't like my boss. I'm out. And so right. alignment, that connection with your organization is key. Do you believe in the company's mission and vision and values? And can you align yourself and your team in that direction? That's alignment. So that's what I learned through all of the interviews with people. And that's what the book is about. It's a, it's a path of how you have to connect with yourself first, to connect with your team, to then ultimately connect with your company. Yeah, I, I really love how you just described that. Uh, and it does all start with just a better understanding and knowledge of self, right? You have to go through the work, uh, the self-reflective process to better understand yourself, what drives you, what motivates you. That's part of why we saw a shift during the pandemic, because people had time, in many cases, the, the first time in years to really reflect on what matters to them, what are their values, and where is that alignment and congruence? or the lack thereof in their current roles, positions, working with their organization or connection with their leader. Um, and yeah, for the first time, many people recognized, realized that, oh, you know, I'm not happy. I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like who I'm working for or the organization I'm working with. Um, that alignment piece is huge. That congruence piece is huge. And there's no possible way that you can have good alignment and congruence if you don't first understand what matters to you. Uh, and you can't possibly connect with people in genuine and authentic ways if you don't first understand <laughs> where you're coming from, because you can't be genuine if if you don't know who you actually are, who you really are. Um, you can't possibly understand where other people are coming from either if you can't first be honest with yourself. Absolutely. That was a beautiful synthesis and summary, John. Thank you. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, wonderful. Michelle, this has just been a great conversation. I note the time. I need to let you go here in just a few minutes. I also know we only scratched the surface, but thankfully you have a wonderful book that people can pick up to learn more about everything we've been talking about today. Before we wrap things up, if you can just provide us uh, and the listeners with a little bit of how they can get connected with you, where they can find your book, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Oh, thank you so much, John. Yes. So people can go to my website, Michelle K. Johnston, and they can learn more about the book. They can buy the book. Um, I also have a podcast called The Seismic Shift, where this season we're exploring disconnection. And, um, and I also have an assessment called the communication preference profile to help you understand yourself and what your preferences are when it comes to connection. So 
ultimately what I really want people to do is contact me because I want to know what, what creates connection, what creates disconnection, you know, holler at me, fill out the contact form. I would love to hear from you all, the listeners. I'm writing my second book right now, and it's going to be called Connection Drives Results. So I'm really interested in this data collection of what builds connection and what tears it down. So I would love to hear from everybody. And John, I just received news this morning that the Seismic Shift just won the Silver Medal Award for Global Books. So congratulations. Um, I, I'm wonderful. so excited because I, I just had a feeling that that the timing was right, the message was right. And I'm so grateful that this message is gaining such traction and people are realizing that we do we do want positive work environments where people can thrive. And how do you do that? We as leaders need to shift and we need to connect. And so join me in the movement. Connection drives results. And I would love to hear from all of you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Again, it's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Michelle can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. You can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.